What's up, bio nerdlings? In this episode, we are going to be discussing the heterozygote advantage and beyond. All right, so phenotypic variations aren't directed by the environment, but they occur through random changes in the DNA and through gene combinations. So changes in genetic information can be silent with no observable phenotypic effects, or they can result in a new phenotype. So if you think back to when we spoke about mutations, silent, we would call it a point mutation that was synonymous, meaning even though our nucleotide bases may have changed, it's still going to code for the same amino acid. So one thing changes, but it didn't change the amino acid sequence, which means there's not going to be a difference in the protein. So some phenotypic variations can significantly increase or decrease the fitness of the organism within that population. So if you look at this bison right here, he obviously is exhibiting albinism. If you can look right here, right down there, um, he has red eyes, which is a characteristic trait of organisms that are albino. Uh, he lacks pigmentation right here as well in all of his hair. So unfortunately, if a predator is in the area, they're going to be able to pick this guy out a lot easier than the rest of the herd because the herd moves together and they all kind of blend in together and they can't tell, you know, where one buffalo starts and the next one ends or where one bison starts and the next one ends. Um, however, this guy is going to stick out like a sore thumb. So preserving genetic variation. Some of genetic variation is population represents neutral variation. And these are differences in the DNA sequence that don't confer a selective advantage or a selective disadvantage. There are several mechanisms that can counter the tendency for directional or stabilizing selection to reduce variation. And remember, directional and stabilizing selection were those graphs, and I'll make sure I go over those at the end of this uh, little lecture here. So we have diploidy, we have balancing selection, the heterozygote advantage, and frequency-dependent selection. So diploidy, this is in diploid eukaryotes, which we are, we have two sets of chromosomes or two copies of every single gene that we have. Uh, some of them are dominant, some of them are recessive. Now if we have recessive genes, we're not going to be able to see that phenotype. So for example, I have brown hair, but I might be big B, little b, and have a trait for blonde hair, but only the brown one shows through because I have two genes for it. In contrast, an organism that's haploid is going to express every single gene they have. So they only have one B. If it's a big B, they're brown. If it's a little B, they're blonde. And that's the trait that's going to show through in the phenotype. Basically, what you see is what you get. And it also reduces genetic variability. So in diploidy, recessive alleles persist by propagation in heterozygote individuals, meaning I'm a carrier. I'm carrying the you know, trait for blonde hair. I'm carrying that little B with me. Uh, this latent variation is exposed to natural selection only when both parents carry the same recessive allele and two copies end up in the zygote. Basically, if, you know, I select a mate and I contribute my little b and he contributes, he has a little b as well, then we could have a blonde child, even though both of us have brown hair. We both donated our recessive allele to contribute to our baby and our baby wound up with blonde hair. So as you can expect, it happens very rarely if the allelic frequency of the recessive allele is very low. So why is heterozygote protection of potentially negative recessive alleles important to species survival? We will soon find out. So next up is balancing selection. Uh, this is a selection that occurs when natural selection maintains two or more forms in a population. So this type of selection includes the heterozygote advantage and frequency-dependent selection. So the heterozygote advantage involves an individual who's heterozygous at a particular gene locus and has a greater fitness than a homozygous individual. So being heterozygous is actually an advantage. So the most common example of being uh, heterozygote and it being an advantage is sickle cell anemia. So let me, let me go back real quick. So this is a sickle cell. Uh, our normal blood cells look like this. They look like little discs. And this is a sickle cell. Now, people that are homozygous for the sickle cell trait that you see right there, 
um, they're going to have a lot of problems. Uh, they're going to be very sick. They can get blood clots very easily. Um, these kind of get caught up, as you can see. They're not a very friendly shape, so they get stuck in places. Uh, all kinds of problems. So looking up here, our big A, big A is the normal blood genotype. Uh, and it gives no protection to malaria. Then we have big T, big T. This is the sickle cell disease. And most people that are homozygous for sickle cell disease will die at a younger age. Uh, and then we have the heterozygote, which is big A, big T. And this gives some type of malaria protection. So the sickle cell D disease is caused by a single base substitution mutation. It is maintained in the population in a state of balanced polymorphism because the protective effect it has against malaria, which is conferred by the heterozygous state. So the heterozygote is resistant to malarial parasite, which kills a large number of people each year in Africa. So there's a balancing selection between the fierce selection against homozygous sickle cell sufferers, because they're going to be very sickly and eventually die, and the selection against the standard homozygous by malaria. The heterozygote has a permanent advantage, and it serves as a higher fitness wherever malaria exists. So again, right here, being homozygous on either end, being homozygous normal, where you have your regular you know, disc-shaped red blood cells, is disadvantageous if you live in an area that has a high frequency of malaria. On the other spectrum, if you are homozygous recessive and have that sickle cell disease completely, you're also going to die off because you're going to be very sickly as well. So having that heterozygote advantage, that carrier basically, that your some blood cells are normal, some blood cells are sickle, is going to serve a large purpose. So let me kind of give you an idea of how this works because everybody kind of hears, okay, malaria, heterozygote advantage, but they don't really understand why it's an advantage. So regular white, or excuse me, regular red blood cells, the ones that are like those little discs, they have about a lifespan of 120 days, give or take. So the malaria parasite has a reproductive cycle of 100 days. So it has to be able to reproduce and spread throughout the body uh, through the red blood cells. So because regular red blood cells have a lifespan of 120 days, it gives time for the malarial parasite to reproduce and spread throughout the body. Now, sickle cells only have a lifespan of 80 days. After 80 days, they die off uh, and are replaced by new sickle cells. So because of that, after 80 days, they're kind of wiped out. Those 80 days prevent that malarial parasite from spreading because they're dying off and they're not allowing that malaria parasite to spread who has to have 100 days in order to complete the reproductive cycle. So that's why being heterozygous for the sickle cell trait is going to be an advantage because it's going to allow some of your red blood cells to remain healthy, the ones that are actually sickle celled. Um, it's going to help kill off the parasite. So that's kind of how that works. Uh, looking right here just shows a global map of where the allele is most frequent. So obviously you're going to see uh, in Africa, you're going to see that heterozygous advantage really show up in Africa for the malarial parasite. And so kind of moving along, uh, we as humans impact variation in other species quite drastically at times. So one of the biggest examples or most common examples we've spoken about has been the peppered moth. So before the Industrial Revolution, um, everything was clean and beautiful, and so the white moths were selected for because they blended into the tree bark. The black moths were going to be selected against because they were much more visible to birds so they could eat them. Fast forward, we messed up everything again. We created you know, tons and tons of pollution and smog and soot, which covered all of the tree bark. So now the white moths were the ones that, bam, they popped out. So the birds ate the white moths, and now the black moths are the ones that are being selected for, and the white moths are being selected against. So another example is DDT resistance in insects. So, you know, our crops were starting to get eaten by insects. We came up with the amazing idea of DDT, sprayed it everywhere, and then realized that it had all kinds of negative effects that worked its way up the food chain. Um, one of the, probably the most common examples of, you know, how it affected uh, other organisms in a very, very negative way 
would be different bird species. Uh, DDT would get into their bodies, obviously, um, and it would cause them to, weigh, uh, to lay very brittle shells. So when the mama birds would go to sit on their eggs in the nest, she would actually wind up crushing the eggs and they would break apart. So we saw a huge decrease in different bird species. Uh, one of the most common known ones would be the California condor. So, of course, another thing that happens is the overuse of antibiotics, which has led to an increase in antibiotic resistant bacteria. So here's kind of like a little petri dish filled with different types of bacteria. We add an antibiotic, wipes out most of the bacteria. We have some resistant bacteria left, which are left to reproduce and create a more resistant strain of bacteria. So I just spoke a little bit about the overuse of antibiotics. So this is kind of a pie chart that shows you what percentage of antibiotics are used for what. 75% of antibiotics are used for non-therapeutic use in livestock, meaning that the livestock aren't sick yet. It's kind of like a preemptive measure. We're cramming all these poor animals into these really close quarters that are very dirty. Um, sometimes we don't allow them to see sunlight. It's really horrible. If you want to know more about it, you can take my apes class and I'll, I'll tell you all the sob story. But anyways, um, so 75% of antibiotics are used when animals aren't even sick. It's just, like I said, a preemptive measure because they're kept in such nasty, dirty conditions. We know that they probably are going to get an infection, so let's go ahead and give them antibiotics anyways. 15% um, right here are used in soaps, uh, pesticides, and pets. So uh, soap right here. Here's my dial. And as you can see, it says antibacterial. So if I flip around... I don't know if you can see that, but I'm not going to make you stare at it forever. Uh, and you look, it says active ingredient triclosan, 0.15%, and it's an antibacterial. So we have antibiotics in everything. Uh, and then another one right here, 9% uh, is used for therapy in us as humans. So that's when we, you know, <coughs> we go to the doctor, we get antibiotics. So it has led to MRSA, which is a methicillin-resistant uh, Staphylococcus aureus, which we've spoken about before. A uh, really horrible infection that doesn't really respond to antibiotics at all. So as a wrap-up, we're going to go through the different uh, selection graphs. So again, directional selection is the most common when an environment changes uh, when one phenotype is favored over another. So right here, this used to be our selection curve in the middle something happened and we had a shift. So example for that would be our peppered moths. Um, before the Industrial Revolution, we have our white moths that are favored. After the Industrial Revolution, the black moths are going to be favored. So we had a shift in one direction. Uh, and again, here you see, so original population, we're going to have more white peppered moths. And then after would be Industrial Revolution, we have the shift. And then we have our black peppered moths. Uh, stabilizing selection, this maintains the status quo by favoring the mean phenotype. So you see less and less of the extremes on each edge and mostly um, individuals that share that median. So an example of that would be birth weight. So babies over here that are going to have huge birth weights, that's detrimental. Sometimes the mom doesn't survive. Sometimes the baby will get stuck in the birth canal. So you don't see a lot of babies that are, you know, 13 or 14 pounds because it's dangerous to the baby as well as to the mother. And a lot of times it results in the death of the baby. Nowadays, obviously, we have uh, much more advances uh, in medicine. Uh, we have, you know, neonatal medicine now that helps out. Um, we can perform cesarean sections. Uh, same thing applies to over here. A uh, very low birth weight pretty much indicates, you know, your baby's probably sickly, it's premature. Uh, again, the baby will probably die off. But because of advances in medicine, a lot of times we can save premature babies as well now. And then our last one is going to be our disruptive selection. This occurs when the extreme phenotypes are favored, and it can actually lead to speciation, which means uh, different species. So we have our mean and then all of a sudden we have our two differences so you know big difference over here big difference over here there's nobody in the middle an example of that would be the wood frog and the leopard frog uh, those are two frogs that have you know become two different species uh, the wood frog breeds in early april leopard frog breeds in mid-april and so they've basically separated out 
they no longer breed at the same time. So we also have geographic variation, which can result in different variation between population subgroups in different areas. So, you know, which could lead to different selection for mates. You know, all the guys over here want to date the guy that has the cool yellow spots. Even though he could interbreed over here, if he doesn't have cool yellow spots over here, you know, he thinks he's cool over here, but he's really not, no female's going to want to breed with him. So again, that can lead to speciation. And then we have clines. And a cline is a graded change in a trait along a geographic axis. So looking over here, we have average male sparrow size. So one being the smallest, and then eight being the largest. So even though they're the same species now, uh, their size ranges. And so in different geographic locations, females might want a larger sparrow, or in others, they might want a smaller sparrow. So again, you might start to see speciation of that occur. Well. I hope this was helpful for you guys. If you would like to rewatch this video or any more for AP Biology or APES, you can go to my website at nerdlingscience.com. Well, this is the Queen Nerdling signing off for now. Stay nerdy till next time.